to fish or not to fish? That is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of cyber attackers or to take arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing end them. I think Shakespeare was on to something, but there is nothing poetic about getting attacked by a cyber criminal or worse, being a victim. Hi, I'm Tyrone Harmon, or as my friends like to call me, Ty the Cyber Guy. And I'm so excited to welcome you to our hashtag Be Cyber Smart event to talk about everything that we're going to be doing to change the narrative about cybersecurity. Our two guest speakers, Josh McLeod and Semyon, will share valuable insights on how we can all be more cyber smart. I'll tell you more about them in a minute, though. To understand the state of affairs in cyberspace, we have to follow the money. Cybersecurity is a big business, so it's no surprise that the situation is coming to a boiling point. Here are some stats for you. So there will be one ransomware attack every 11, 11 seconds by 2022. This is an increase of about 20% compared to the last three years. The World Economic Forum reported in 2021 that cybersecurity failure is among the top five global risks. Aware cyber smart citizens and professionals are needed now more than ever. This couldn't be more obvious in the light of some of the attacks we've had just in the first half of this year. Let's do a quick year in review, shall we? Here are some of the top cyber attacks of late 2021 and early 2022 from around the world. In December 2021, a ransomware cyber attack hit government websites in Brazil, including platforms that track vaccinations and epidemiological data on COVID. The platform was offline for nearly two weeks. In February 2022, the Germany energy giant Marquard and Balls was attacked and saw its IT infrastructure completely destabilized. The result was the closure of more than 200 gas stations across Germany. Before you start to feel hopeless, know this. Education is the best countermeasure to cybercrime, which is why we're excited to have Semyon at Cisco talk about Networking Academy Cybersecurity Pathway, available for free on skillsforall.com. This can lead to exciting work opportunities in our field. Semyon is an educational and technology expert currently driving and supporting the development of Cisco's Corporate Social Responsibility Program Networking Academy in Europe. He has 15 years of experience working in international ICT educational projects. Also joining us today is Josh McLeod, National Cybersecurity Officer at Cisco. As part of Cisco Securities and Trust Organization, Josh is responsible for protecting Cisco's enterprise infrastructure, products and services, collaborating with government and industry to improve national cybersecurity posture. So without further ado, join me in giving a warm welcome to our first speaker, Josh McLeod. Welcome, Josh. Hi, Tyrone. Thank you very much. And uh, really appreciate the introduction and the reference to Shakespeare there. I see him in a new light now. I have to go back and reread it. So thank you, everyone. Um, I'd like to start today by actually taking you through a case study of an attack that happened back in 2017. Now, you might wonder why 2017? You know, there are so many cases that happen uh, almost every day. Well, that's just the point. They are happening every day. You could literally read the newspaper right now or, you know, any online blog and find a particular attack to reference. But this particular one I want to talk about, known as not Petia, was significant in a number of ways, in how quickly it spread, in the type of attack it was, and the impact it had financially on a global basis. I would recommend also, if you're interested in learning more about this, because it's simply a good read, is that you visit um, Wired or Google, The Untold Story of Not Petty, as you can see here, <clears throat> by the author, <clears throat> excuse me, Andy Greenberg. And it really goes through in a very compelling and readable way how this attack unfolded and what happened. So this attack originated in Ukraine. So I think that's also another reason to talk about it because it's very relevant to uh, events going on now. And as you can imagine, the person or the entity that launched the attack is probably one we could guess at. But this particular threat actor started by attacking a software company known as Linkos. What they managed to do is to hack into the company's network infrastructure and ultimately find its update servers. 
for a piece of software known as MEDOC or MEDOC. This is a piece of software that's widely used in the Ukraine. It's for financial uh, planning. It's used for uploading taxes. Um, it's used by just about every business in Ukraine. And what they were able to do was infect that that network and get access to the install servers and the build process of the software so that they could insert backdoors and additional code into the software. So what kind of code did they add to the software? Fundamentally, there are three malware components they added. One known as Eternal Blue is actually a tool that was leaked. Um, it was originally created by the NSA, but it got leaked onto the internet and they included that. That tool was very good at discovering vulnerabilities in Microsoft Windows uh, software, infecting them, and then spreading automatically. So once there was an infection with Eternal Blue on a network, it could explode the network and take over everything in minutes. It also included another piece of software known as Mimicats. This is actually a, a piece of, you could call it a utility that is allowed to attack a, a network device or to attack a PC but it's also used by malicious uh, actors. In this case, they harness the Mimikatz tool in order to steal credentials from memory on Windows workstations. So it could kind of compromise the memory structure in the device and take out the password and username. So as it would use Eternal Blue to spread, it would also use Mimikatz to steal credentials and ultimately escalate privileges across the network. Now within this was ransomware, and I put that in quotes because Ransomware, as it's designed to do, is to encrypt uh, a PC or a device, uh, essentially preventing you from getting at your data and then tell you have to pay a ransom in order to get the key to decrypt it. Well, in this case, this decryption was not reversible. There was no key. So what we call, we, we describe this as wiper malware. So you can right away know that the goal of this was not ransom, even though it was masquerading as ransomware. The goal was to create destruction. So as this software was compromised and users went out to download the latest version of the software, it spread like wildfire. It would infect a device. The Eternal Blue component would scan for other vulnerable workstations, compromise them, steal their credentials, rinse and repeat. And this went on and on and on. Now, it just so happens that Maersk, one of the world's largest shipping conglomerates, had an office in um, in, in Odessa, which is obviously a port city in Ukraine. And with that particular office that they had, um, just like anybody else, they had to use the MEDOC accounting software in order to interact with the government and do business. So happens that they updated their software as well, which downloaded the back door. And that created a foothold that let it spread throughout their entire network. Within seven minutes, the majority of their devices were compromised. And even worse, ultimately, it was able to comp compromise and encrypt their domain controllers. The domain controllers are essentially the keystone of any enterprise network. They hold all the user accounts and passwords. If that gets compromised, in this case, encrypted and rendered useless, that means nobody can log into the network. You can't get access to your data. You can't get access to servers. In many cases, you can't even log into your PC. This had the effect of ultimately halting Maersk as a business. All of the software that they depended on for logistics, for unloading containers for ships, figuring out where those containers went, loading them back on ships, permitting trucks in and out of the ports, all of this was compromised because the directory controller, the domain controller, was unusable. Now, when we look back at what was the impact of NotPetya globally, the White House estimates that it cost about $10 billion. 300 million of that, it was obviously uh, Maersk was impacted. That's in fact, people think they were impacted more, thinking about the time and the cost it took them to get back up and running, which was right around a week's time. But globally, all of the businesses that not Petia impacted cost us about $10 billion. So that's why I'd like to talk a little bit about today about cybersecurity, give you a better perspective of how these attacks work and how we have to think about the cybersecurity, what it is, and risk, how we address that risk, but ultimately for the purpose of making you more cyber smart. Because when we think about cybersecurity, we recognize that of all of the things that cybersecurity depends on, humans, people are the weakest link. And by educating ourselves, taking simple steps to make ourselves 
and our organization more secure, we can actually in many ways become a human firewall to protect against these threats. One thing I want to point out, as I go through this presentation, you will see an icon in the upper right-hand corner. These refer to NETACAD courses as part of the Skills for All curriculum that that particular, the content on that particular slide refers to. We'll share this deck after the presentation. You'll be able to get access to it. But the idea is, if you want to learn more about what this slide is talking, go deeper. Here's a course that you can actually follow and take that will help you understand more and will really get you on the journey to uh, developing uh, career-ready skills in cybersecurity. Let me start off with some basics. If somebody were to stop you on the street and ask you, what is cybersecurity? I think um, a lot of people might say, oh, it's about keeping viruses off your computer, or things like that. But there's actually a definition that we all use that is as simple as it gets. Protecting, cybersecurity is about protecting three things. The confidentiality, meaning we want to keep private things private. The integrity, keep things as they are. Don't allow them to be altered or changed unless we want them to. And available that we should be able to access the systems. Co confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information. That is what cybersecurity is. No matter what circumstance you think about, whether we're talking about the cloud or a PC, it's all about doing one of those three things. And the priority of them can change in different contexts. But one of those three things, or all of those three things, in order to safeguard everything we depend on in our digital world. But even though we can talk about cybersecurity in really relatively simplistic terms, as we know, things are much more complicated than that. Security really has to be thought of as an interdependent chain of capabilities. In order to realize that confidentiality, integrity, and availability, we have to secure a lot of things that are interdependent. First of all, we need secure products. And what do I mean by secure products? Well, I mean those things that, uh, whether they're PCs, they're a cloud software, or they're instances of applications. Um, unfortunately, in many cases, because humans are at the center of all these things, there are vulnerabilities that creep into them. People make mistakes when they code software, and sometimes the mistakes are really obvious, sometimes they're not obvious. But products can have vulnerabilities. So we need to make sure that we have secure products. After that, we need to make sure that we implement them securely through secure configurations. It's no good to have a secure product that has no password set or has no access controls on what you can configure or do with the device. So we need to make sure that the device is hardened and locked down and only the people with the privileges to access it have those privileges. Then they need to be in a secure environment, meaning wherever this software or this instance uh, of IT is running, we need to protect it so that, for example, not anybody can access it across the internet. And then overriding all of this are what we could describe as secure practices. How do we make sure that the processes and procedures and technologies that we use to keep everything secure are being done on a daily basis? We describe this as hygiene, things like updating software regularly, making sure all of the users who have access to things only have the access they need to do their work. All of these things combine in order to build this chain that ultimately we need to take care of in order to be secure. Now, when we think about capabilities, any capability is made up of three things. It's made up of a process, it's made up of a technology, and it's made up of people. A process is about the steps you follow to do something. So it may be, how do I make sure that I configure this operating system with the right settings so that only people with the right privileges access it? Technology is obviously the, the tool that we have in place to affect that. Uh, having a function such as being able to set passwords, to encrypt communications. And then people who are at the center of all of this who have to get both of these things right have to have the right process, have the right technology, and all of that has to be built in the right way in order for things to be secure. But as I say, unfortunately, people are the weakest link. Technology does what we tell it, and the process is only as good as what we put together. But people make mistakes, we're fallible, as I say. When we build software, when we install software, sometimes we don't do the right job. Sometimes we make very obvious mistakes. Sometimes we're not monitoring what's going on inside of our environment. We see that well, somebody is actually accessing something they shouldn't be. 
Maybe we've got the wrong architecture, policy, or oversight. There are so many places where people can make mistakes that ultimately leads to an erosion of the foundational cybersecurity that we need to protect them. And there's a simple statistic, <clears throat> excuse me, that bears this out. When we look across all of the types of breaches that go on out there, um, somebody hacking into a system, somebody stealing credentials, the biggest vector of attack, the largest, is phishing. And phishing is all about people, about sending something, whether it's a text or an email, some message in front of somebody that convinces them that this is legitimate and they should engage with it. They should click on a link. They should open an attachment. They should execute things on the attachment. And all of that comes down to people and the choices that people make. So as we start to think about this, because that's what cybersecurity is, but cybersecurity is more than just these foundational definitional components. It's also about how we think about risk. Ultimately, risk is our evaluation of the probability of an event occurring and the impact that could have on us. And this is important, how we think about risk in cybersecurity, because we can't protect all things everywhere at 100%. There is no 100% security. We have to take the limited resources and the limited capabilities we have and protect what matters most, most. So how we think about cybersecurity risk is the way that security practitioners ultimately go about their job. There's a definition for cybersecurity risk, and a lot of these are drawn from standards out there. One of the great things about cybersecurity is that there are a lot of standards that give us definitions and guidance and frameworks for how we approach this challenge. Ultimately, the problem is that people don't do necessarily a good job of following it. But cyber risk is how we think about the ultimate harm that could come to an organization based on the threat that's out there, what could possibly try to come after us, the vulnerabilities, what weaknesses would they exploit, and then what impact that could have for us. Now, there's another concept I want to introduce before we talk more about cyber risk that is foundational to how we think about cybersecurity. Because Cyber risk or cyber attacks are not atomic incidences. They don't just happen. Like the dependency chain of cyber capabilities, there's a dependency chain of cyber attacks. Whatever the attack is, you can say it's somebody going after um, a user's credentials, hacking into their device on a star Fox network, trying to bring down a large company, whatever it is, there are a common set of activities that occur that can guide us about how we think about risk in protecting ourselves. So this is known as the cyber attack chain is a model that goes back many years, developed originally by Lockheed Martin, and it characterizes the way attacks in one shape or form or other unfold. The first is what we call reconnaissance. The attacker has to figure out who their target is and what the footprint is that they have, where are their potential weaknesses, what are the assets that might be of value. Once they know that, then they have to create something that can go after those assets. You know, do I send them an email that gets somebody to click on it, or do I try to hack through to a server system that's running in the cloud? Using that attack, they ultimately want to deliver something. That delivery could be malware, it could be an email into the environment. After it's delivered, it needs to exploit something. Because in order to take control and compromise a device, there has to be a vulnerability there. Or, and that vulnerability doesn't just mean a software bug. It could be a misconfiguration or a lack of appropriate security there. Once it exploits, then it tends to install itself. So you've got somebody who received a phishing email. That was the delivery. They clicked on an attachment that ran a macro that caused a memory buffer overflow that allowed them to then inject software that was installed. And now the attacker has a presence on that device. And usually with that presence, the attacker needs to be able to control it remotely because they're not sitting there in front of the computer able to guide and do it. They need to control that, send commands, and use that as their foothold in the environment to conduct further exploits. And they may have hundreds of PCs under their control and do so through automated means. But as the attackers use this process to ultimately get at what they want, the final step is to act. An act is what they're after. It's stealing data, it's encrypting data and extracting ransom for it. 
But when you think about risk and what an attacker does and how you can defend about against that, this is one of the models we use to be able to evaluate how the process unfolds. So let me come back to that point about risk. Now I think we're set up to go a little bit deeper into this. So given the definition before, the general formula for thinking about cyber risk is to think about threats times vulnerabilities times consequence. When we say threat, we have to sit down and think about who could come after us and why and how would they do it? Is this threat actor a nation state, in which case we're going to be in big trouble? Or is this somebody just poking around in our organization, seeing what they can compromise? And depending on who they are, <clears throat> what would they do? Would they use phishing techniques or would they use uh, something where they sneak a, a USB device and hand it off to an insider inside of a network? We have to first think about, <clears throat> given who we are, like, for example, if we were that Ukrainian company, Linkos, and we were doing risk cyber risk assessment, we would think about, well, maybe a neighboring country might come after us. And what are their capabilities? And given threat intelligence, how do they usually attack networks? Then we have to think about vulnerabilities. And vulnerabilities are largely composed of two things. Assets, meaning what people could go after, and the exposure of that asset, meaning the weakness. If an asset has no weaknesses, then the possibility that somebody could attack it is much lower. It's really the um, relationship between the threat and the vulnerability that determines whether or not you're likely to get attacked. But of course, you have to consider that in terms of the consequences. Because as I said, security is a scarce resource. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough technology. We don't have enough money to protect everything all the time. So we have to pick and choose. What are our most important assets by virtue of how easily somebody could go after them? How likely it would be that they would compromise? And then if they did compromise, what could happen? So when we think about Maersk, how would you rate the risk in their environment when you think about their IT assets? The domain controller that we talked about, which if, in, if, which if compromised could lead to a compromise in the entire network, the risk associated with that is very high. The vulnerabilities may or may not be there. The threat may not be there. But if it is compromised, it takes the entire network down. So this is a calculation we have to do. This helps us start to dig into thinking about and analyzing the cyber risk that leads us to defenses. Because this whole process that I'm describing is what's known as threat-centric cybersecurity. Don't think about cybersecurity in terms of, well, we need to protect this, so let's buy a firewall. We need to protect this, so let's install some anti-malware software. You need to start by the risk, and that means thinking about the threats, what they could do, and what the implications of that could be. So when it comes to threat actors, this list is probably not exhaustive, but generally we can put threat actors, those who would seek to do you harm in the cyber sense, uh, at least minimally, as falling into one of these categories. So if it's a nation state, they would go after you as a company or a government for purposes of espionage, political reasons, economic or military. We're seeing that play out on the world stage right now. And I have to say, when it comes to nation state actors, they're the most difficult to deal with. They have unlimited resources. They're dogged. They're persistent. They, until they reach their goal, they will keep at it. So if somebody is attacked by a nation state actor, there's a very good chance they're not going to be able to su successfully defend against it. Cyber criminals, however, are motiv motivated by financial gain. They want to get the most return for the least effort. So they will attack something. They will find the easiest way to get in there. If it's too difficult for them, they're going to go and move somewhere else. So it's a different calculation when you think about somebody coming after us who may be a cyber criminal versus a nation state actor. And then we have other things. Hacktivists, we don't see that as much anymore. We have terrorist organizations and insiders. Each of them have different motives. Each of them have different ways that they will attack you. But this is the first step about thinking about considering cyber risk, is considering your threat actor. Once we've noted or considered our threat actor, then we think about something known as TTTs, TTP, sorry, tactics, techniques, and procedures which is just a fancy way of saying, how would they attack you? One of the frameworks out there that's widely used in the cybersecurity industry is known as the MITRE ATT&CK framework. 
And this borrows from the concept that I introduced earlier around the cyber attack chain of doing reconnaissance, followed by weaponization, followed by delivery, and so on and so forth, and breaks it down into a more quantifiable series of categories that allows to describe the nature of the tactic, technique, or procedure an attacker might use to compromise us. So you could see the first category is known as initial access because they got to get into your network or they got to get into your resource or whatever it is. And then it describes all of the different ways currently understood from a category perspective that attackers do this. And when you actually dive into it, it gets very detailed and very specific. This type of information informs how we think about defending ourselves. Because, for example, if one of the techniques is defense evasion, meaning they compromise your device, they install malware, but you've got security tools running on the device or running in your environment. So they want to disable those if they can. So when you think about defending yourself and the tactics and techniques and procedures they might use, you could think about, well, if they try to disable security tools, how can we block that? How can we stop that? The next thing we think about now that we have a sense of who might go after us, how they might do it, is what assets exist in our environment. And frankly, the assets are everything connected to a network and things that aren't are even connected to a network we have to think about as well. Because if we go back to the um, attack on the uh, Iran uh, nuclear processing facility, that was not connected to the internet. That was what we call an air gap network. So how did somebody who was not the Iranian government or not the network administrators necessarily get something outside of Iran into that facility? Well, it happened. So there are other ways this can happen. Somebody can be a complicit insider. Somebody could sneak a USB stick inside, whatever. But everything is a target. And within that, whether it's an endpoint, a network, or server application, it's largely the data and it's the access that those devices provide that a user would be after. So they go after the assets, but we're only vulnerable if there are exposures or we're only exposed if there are vulnerabilities. And there are a number of different categories of vulnerabilities. We tend to think of them largely in terms of system flaws, meaning there's a software bug. Okay, well, that means we have to patch. Uh, or there's a misconfiguration. Somebody didn't turn on security. But there are other things. You can have a password, but maybe the password is weak. weak. Or maybe you didn't set the password, even though there's a password function installed. Or maybe the human is just gullible and clicked on a link that they shouldn't and gave access to something. Maybe there's a lack of oversight. Exposures happen in, another, in a number of ways. And as you can see through these, many of them boil down to what people do or what people do wrong. But when you take all of this, you take a step back and you think, you know, what, what constitutes risk and what is the impact? Well, the impact has two aspects to it. One is generally financial. We all tend to think about this as a, an above the line impact, that when it comes down to it, if you are breached, there are a number of ways that's gonna cost you. There could be fines, there's the cost of containing the incident, responding to it, uh, maybe having to you know, buy new devices that may have been destroyed, impact to your brand, loss of jobs. Now, this figure that I'm showing here is something put together by Frost and Sullivan in a study com uh, commissioned by Microsoft. And they looked at a particular year, what is the total cost of cybersecurity, the economic impact of cybersecurity in Singapore for that particular year? And they estimated it as $17.7 billion. That was just one year. So we know that the impact we see from cybersecurity is a huge financial implication. But there's a secondary impact that's important to think about. And the reason I mention is because it really needs to drive how we think about cybersecurity and its role in the world today. Cybersecurity also hinders the innovation and digitization of everything that we're doing out there. Uh, Cisco did a study a number of years ago where we talked to organizations that were transitioning, you know, taking a lot of their more manual processes, automating them, going from uh, applications and systems that were hosted inside their network to putting that on the cloud, coming up with apps that interacted with other companies' websites, everything that we describe as digitization. And we asked them, 
you know, what role does cybersecurity play? <clears throat> 71% said that threats hinder innovation in my organization. And there are a number of reasons for that. Like we can't get sign off to do this project because, um, you know, the security team said that we haven't addressed cybersecurity risk properly. You know, there might be personal data in there and we haven't uh, locked it down, thought about how we would lock it down. But even worse, in about 40% of the cases, organizations said, we had a mission critical project going on, but we had to stop it or we had to pause it because we couldn't address the cybersecurity concern. And so this secondary impact has to do with the fact that it, it prevents us from pursuing our digital agenda, from being able to come up with these innovative ideas and execute them, things that will make people's lives better, will lead to new companies forming, that cybersecurity restrains them. So I say this because we really need to think about cybersecurity, yes, as protecting things, keeping things from being lost or having financial impact. But we also need to think about cybersecurity as unleashing digital potential. There's this saying that people in cybersecurity use, why do cars have brakes to go faster? Why do you have cybersecurity to unleash digital potential? Maybe you can quibble with the analogy, but the idea is that you need to have this in place in order to avoid being attacked in order to have these systems torn down so that you lose hundreds of millions of dollars and ultimately people abandon these projects. So let's turn it back <clears throat> to you. I've been talking in you know, very broad, uh, maybe definitional terms here about some of the cybersecurity theory and how we think in this world, giving you really just a flavor of this. But not everybody is gonna be a cybersecurity professional in the sense that they're going to be monitoring for threats or responding to threats. But everybody has a role to play in cybersecurity. So what I'd like to talk about now is things you can do on a daily basis to stay safe, to keep your assets safe, and to protect your organization's assets as well. How can you become that stronger link in the cybersecurity chain? And how can you be that human firewall? Generally, on an individual basis, there are four things you can do. Secure your accounts. Click with caution. I use that to say, you know, be wary of spam. Keep your software up to date and protect your privacy. Privacy and security are sometimes addressed separately, but they're really interrelated. That loss of privacy can also lead to a loss of cybersecurity and vice versa. So let's talk for a moment about securing your accounts. <clears throat> um, I, I tell everybody in my family to do this, but I think still they don't. You know, when I say to my dad, hey, you just signed up for this service online. Um, maybe instead of me buying it myself, <clears throat> you could give me access to the service. And he says, sure, here's my password. I'm like, ah, that's the same password you use for everything, dad. Uh, I've told you a million times, you know, it needs to be like this. But people are people. So your password should be long at least 16 characters, they should be random and they should be different for every account. So it should be like the example I show here on the slide, some series of characters that don't mean anything. Great, how am I going to remember a long random, seemingly random password for every website out there? This is where password managers come into play. Everybody should be using a password manager. Uh, there are better ones out there, I happen to use one password. I've used Dashlane in the past, LastPass. The important thing is that password managers allow you to, when you set up uh, your account at a website, will automatically generate a password for you. And you can make it as long as you want and will capture the user account and the password you created for that account. And then it embeds inside your brow browser or on your phone so that anytime you visit that website, it will automatically come up and say, oh, you're visiting google.com. Should I autofill your google.com account name and password? And before doing that, it'll do the biometric check or whatever on your phone or your PC. And then once you clear that, it fills in that unique password. So I don't know what my passwords are for all of my accounts out there. Now, the good news is we're actually starting to move beyond passwords to what we call a passwordless world. And in that password passwordless world, we're going to cut this step out because passwords don't work for the reasons I described. No matter how much I tell my dad, you know, use long complex passwords, no matter the fact that he has one password installed, he just doesn't end up doing it. So it's not fair to users. So passwordless means 
that you'll go to a website, you'll put in your username or whatever identifies you, and then it will challenge you with some sort of biometric authentication. And then that's it. You're in. You scan your fingerprint. There's no password to remember. There's no password stored on the server somewhere that could potentially get hacked. It's easy. And it's oftentimes, easy things are more secure things. Wherever it's available, multi-factor authentication should be turned on. You've probably seen this, that they want to send you an SMS code in addition to putting in your password. If it's on by default, great. Make sure that you're using a version where you have to input something from a local authenticator. If it's not on, uh, turn it on. And as I say, use an app authenticator application as a better choice versus being sent the code over SMS because there are ways that people can break that as well. We used to say that you had to constantly change your password. And we find that this is a bad thing because users won't do it and because it makes people choose really simple passwords each time. So what we say now is change your password only if you believe you've been compromised. How do you know you've been compromised? Well, there's this cool website that collects uh, information about hacks out there and dumps of the databases of passwords and usernames that have been collected. And it plugs into many of the password managers. So when you open up your password manager, there's usually a section you can go to that will show you these are all of the accounts you have on various websites where there's been a known breach and we have identified that your password is showing up. And then you can just go and change that one. Finally, on this user account stuff, I know this sounds like a lot, but if you do a good enough job around this, at least if you do nothing else, you know, try to use long complex passwords in a password manager. Oftentimes websites will ask you for some sort of information that will help you recover your account. Like if you need to recover your password, they'll send it to your email address, but they for, or an option to reset it, but they first need to know a piece of information that only you know, your mother's maiden name, your first car, your favorite airline, whatever it is. Don't put real information in there because remember that reconnaissance process I talked about where people going after a target, they learn about their target. They see, oh yeah, well, I know this person's mother's maiden name because that's easy to find out. Or I know somebody who knows what their first car is. Create something that's basically garbage, a nonsensical response, and then put that in the password manager with the account so that it's handy. If you do all of this, I guarantee you, you're doing gold standard of security and not more can be asked of you. Now, when it comes to um, clicking with caution, being, uh, uh, you know, trying to avoid being a victim of ransomware, there is no formula <clears throat> we can offer you in the sense that you do A, B, and C, and you're golden. You, you have to be a skeptical person and um, you have to think about this information I'm getting, is it plausible? Where is it coming from? So that's the first thing. Does it pass the smell test? And there's no formula for that. You just have to look at something and say, I wasn't expecting an email from these people or I've never heard of this service before. The next thing you can do is if there's a link associated with it, if there's an attachment, probably don't, don't launch it. That's simple enough if you weren't expecting it. But if there's a link, there are ways that you can reveal what the actual URL is associated with that link, depending on where you are. Like a PC, you can hover over the link, it'll show you the real link. And so you think, oh, this is from EFATS. But if I look at this, I see in there a bunch of garbage. Part of it is mail ru 3 a 2 well, that I would think EFATS would you know, come from a site that says EFATS. Maybe you go Google it, see, yeah, efax.com. Um, whether you're using an iOS device or an Android device, there are other ways, too, that you can figure out. So before you click on anything, check the URL out before actually going to it. And you know what? You can always throw it away. You can ignore it. You know, delete an email. Chances are, if it's really important, it'll come back to you and they'll find other ways of contacting you. As I said, avoid launching attachments. And if you do launch an attachment, um, a lot of times they will have some way that says, oh, in order for this to work or display correctly, you have to click this button that, that will load content. What that's doing is running a macro. It's scripting language inside of Microsoft Word, Excel, what have you. And attackers very often use these seemingly legitimate looking documents to masquerade as, as you know, something that you are supposed to read. Oh, you click on this button, enable content. And then this script runs that actually goes out there and downloads malware and compromises your device. Keep software up to date. Um, you know, this one is actually one of the 
biggest challenges industry faces in keeping itself secure. So many vulnerabilities that have been fixed months or years ago were never patched inside of organizations that ultimately are seen as the culprit of a compromise. When the organization goes back and says, oh man, somebody uh, got into our human resources server. How did it happen? Well, it was this uh, vulnerability on the software. Why didn't we patch it? The patch came out a year ago. Well, we don't have a good patching process where nobody was paying attention. That's where the human factor or the process associated with humans come in. So for an individual, uh, if your device permits it, turn on auto updates. I know it's a pain sometimes that you're working and something keeps prompting you to update, but make sure you do that. Regularly check for updates when it comes to applications. So not just your operating system, but whatever apps you're running, uh, go out and check if there's a latest version and then apply it as soon as possible. The final thing I want to talk about is protecting your privacy. And, um, you know, maybe some of this can be a little bit tin foil haddish, but some everybody has a, a spectrum of risk when it comes to their privacy. Some people, you know, no problem. I'm on all the social networks and I'm happy to share everything about myself. Other people don't want anything shared about themselves. So that's your choice. But whatever you do, think about it in terms of that everything you put online in one way or another could be public. So post accordingly. Secondly, if you want to make sure that when you access websites, you keep your interaction secure, you can consider using a VPN or your own Wi-Fi hotspot. So you go to a hotel, you go to a cafe. Uh, it's a good practice because that's an open network. And, you know, there are certain types of attacks people can launch that will, even though you're going to an encrypted secure website, they can redirect your browser and fool you into going to a mock website. You put in your credentials and, you know, they've got you. So if you, you know, go to a Starbucks and you launch a VPN or you use your phone as a personal Wi-Fi hotspot, um, or, you know, whatever it is, that can help you stay secure. It can protect part of your connection. Some people also want to protect what information can be gleaned about them ephemerally. With Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on our phones, we walk around with all over the place, people track us. You walk into a shopping center, they are tracking you. They are able to identify your device. They're able to see where that device keeps, you know, pinging, across Bluetooth and Wi-Fi uh, interfaces across the network, and they can develop a profile about you. Now, this is not necessarily a cybersecurity issue or anything sinister. It's part of the world we live in where things are subsidized by marketing. But if you really want to make sure that people don't collect data about you, which could then be used to profile you, which could be a part of a cyber attack, then when you go into a shopping mall or anywhere public, just turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Personally, I don't do this. This is a bridge too far for me, but it's an option. And if you go online and you put your credit card into something and they give you an option to save, don't click save. Use a password manager to fill it in every time or use a virtual credit card. Now, with that said, these are a lot of suggestions. And I said, you'll, you'll get these slides. I guarantee you, if you become more skeptical, more risk-minded, you will become more secure. But if there's anything to take away, I would say take the time to understand and follow your organizational security policies, whether you're at a university or company, whatever it is, you know, maybe seek out and find out what do they have in place that says what you should or shouldn't do and how do they keep you safe. Then think about protecting yourself, every device you have, how you secure accounts, how you're skeptical about the information you receive and interact with it. And finally, leading into Semyon's talk here, we need more people, we need smart people from diverse backgrounds in this field. A lot of people think, uh, I, I could only get into cybersecurity if I've got a coding background. Want to know what my degree, my undergrad degree was in? Economics with a minor in journalism. Now, I, I have an interest and I've learned a lot about the technology over the years, but you don't have to come from a technology background. We need people who are smart people who are able to think like attackers, people who are interested in this to fill a diversity of roles within the cybersecurity industry. So please join the fight and join up. And with that, I'd like to hand it back to Tyrone and thank everyone for their time. Thank you so much, so much, so much. Um, I really learned a lot and it was really fun watching your session. Um, and 
In your session, I think we've learned so much about how sophisticated attackers breach networks and cause damage. And everybody, Joshua shared about the famous NetPathy attack that paralyzed um, Mars shipping operations and caused billions of dollars in losses globally. We, he also taught us about um, the insights into fundamental cybersecurity concepts, such as cyber risk, the attack chain, and why people are often the weakest link in cyber defense. And finally, we learned about how we can become a human firewall to protect ourselves and our organization against cyber attacks by properly securing login accounts, avoiding phishing, scam, um, scams, undertaking basic data privacy practices, using password managers, using a VPN, and just overall being more cyber smart. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and experience with us, Josh. As humans, we may be the weakest link, but with our insights, we'll leave this event feeling a bit stronger. Up next, we have Semyon to guide us on career opportunities in cybersecurity and educational resources available with Cisco here. Thanks, Tyron. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Semyon, and I would like to take you through your education opportunities at Skills for All at Networking Academy. Can we please go to the first slide of my uh, of my deck? Uh, the next one, please. So today, um, could you please switch? Yeah, this one. Uh, today we'll be speaking about the Skills for All education platform. This is the new generation of the education resource brought to you by Cisco Networking Academy uh, team. Uh, as you know, probably we have a lot of experience in building uh, the education materials. And the new Skills for All platform was designed and built by NetAcad team with the following several considerations uh, in our mind. First of all, this new platform is learner-centric, which means that you are the first person on the stage when you are learning, which means uh, it's never been so easy to learn when you are going through your education in your own pace uh, on your own time. Second consideration, the platform is mobile first, which means that wherever you are, you can study. And basically, we were thinking about the meaning of this word all in the name, skills for all, uh, that actually means that today everyone has a mobile device. Everyone has, well, even several devices that you use in your everyday life. Sometimes you're in front of your PC, sometimes maybe you're not, but you have your tablet with you or you have your smartphone with you, which means that you still can learn. And this new platform was designed uh, with this consideration in mind that wherever you are, you can take your, your uh, full screen device or mobile device and continue your learning journey. And finally, and this is most important, we were designing the courses on the Skills for All, considering that uh, that should build a skill set for your future entry level career opportunity. So we believe that after you take uh, one or several courses at Skills for All, you should be ready to apply for your first entry level job. Could we please go to the next slide? We have many courses already available at Skills for All, and uh, these are about many things, as usually about networks, uh, as usually about security, cybersecurity. We have courses about programming, about IoT, uh, and many other things. But we have created the first um, real pathway, and currently that's what you see in front, uh, in front of your screen. And this pathway consists of six courses, uh, and this pathway is dedicated to cybersecurity, specifically to the uh, very important uh, topic we are, we are talking about today, right? So uh, if you enroll into your first intro to cybersecurity course, that is very, very short. Uh, sometimes I, I tell, this is not even a course, it's a fairy tale be before you go to sleep. And this is really a tiny and very nice course to introduce the security and cybersecurity world to you. So you understand where is, where is that? What is the world we are living in? That's the intro to cybersecurity. And by the way, uh, if you scan that QR code that you see on, if I'm not mistaken, on the right hand side, uh, top uh, part of your screen, you will... Uh, you will be able to self-enroll yourself into this first course. However, after you can continue your journey, taking uh, 
other five courses. Two of them, Networking Basics and Networking Devices and Initial Configuration, are the courses that are talking mostly about networking component. It is important to learn networking component because cybersecurity is uh, is around networks, right? We are protecting ourselves in digital world, uh, working with networking devices. We are all connected. We have many, well, hundreds of things we are using every day that are connected to networks. So that's why we believe it is very important to learn about some network fundamental part here. And here you have networking basics course, which is designed to be a 25 hours learning journey and the networking devices initial configuration also for the same 25 hours. Then you would take three other courses that would be already speaking about cybersecurity. That are endpoint security, network defense and cyber threat management. The duration of these three courses uh, differs from uh, 20 to 40 hours and uh, in all of these three courses you will be learning basically about very many things that Josh was talking today. So you will be exploring different sides of the attacks from where it can come, who are the threat actors, um, what devices or which, what services, which protocols can be attacked and what is actually the risk when you are building uh, starting from your own mobile device, from your own PC or smartphone, or maybe uh, equipping your network for a small office or a small organization or maybe a bigger organization, and thinking from different uh, viewpoints, what is the security um, and how we can defend it, how we can approach uh, the security of um, your device, right, of your server, of your network, uh, Maybe your networking a network printer can it be secured? Well, I guess it can. Uh, learn about it in that uh, in one of these courses. So um, you will learn many many aspects about cybersecurity risks, um, cybersecurity threats, how to deal with these risks, and how to manage uh, manage these threats. These courses all together are represented on the platform and available to everyone for free. And uh, I've done a quick calculation and I figured out these courses altogether has more than 100 lab activities, including packet tracer lab activities, but not only packet tracer lab activities, and more than 150 interactive activities. So it's not boring for you to learn. It's really a lot of fun learning the course at Skills for All platform. Can we please jump to the next slide? Once you completed one of these courses, and actually every of these courses, you will be getting a digital badge uh, for course. That's uh, five badges that you see on the left hand side of the screen. But after you complete the whole education pathway, you will be getting the cybersecurity pathway digital badge that you can use for your resume or for your social networks or in other places where you think it's appropriate. We also have the target certification, which is not obligatory to take. That's just if you want to take it to even more highlight uh, your, your learning achievement in security and cybersecurity. Let's go to the next slide. I've done a quick exercise, uh, not just to be speaking all the time, but I just wanted to show you something visual. So here is, the, for example, the example uh, of several lab screenshots from the networking courses, from these two networking courses that uh, you are continuing after the intro to cyber. So as you see, you will be working with simple network topologies consisting of uh, several end, uh, end devices or endpoints, but also working with internet infrastructure, with servers, with intermediate networking devices like uh, Cisco routers and Cisco switches. You will be using also the command line interface to manage these devices. You will be learning about uh, fundamental network protocols, IP addressing, IPv4, IPv6 also. Maybe also sniffing some networking, uh, some network packets with Wireshark and exploring what's actually happening in your network. Let's go to next slide and I will explore other labs that you will be working while you are going through cyber courses. Here, as you can see, you will be working with uh, different um, devices, operating systems that could be Linux, that could be Windows, that could be a mix uh, of different tools. We will be working with virtual machines that are built into the course, so it's easier for you to set up 
your lab environment. You don't have to configure your own operating system. You just take a virtual machine and uh, and then you're in. And then you will explore different uh, cybersecurity aspects like, uh, like a, a cyber kill chain, which is displayed on this slide. Let's see what we have on the next one. Can you please switch the slide? Um, while you're continuing your journey, you will be working with more complex network topologies, as you can see here, the example. Of course, we will be starting from layer one, cabling the network and building it from scratch, and then configuring it uh, and seeing what's happening inside of the network. Believe me, it's a lot of fun, and you don't have to, to have anything, basically, except of your uh, device, your computer, packet tracer installed, and at some point, a virtual machine. So you can progress with all of these labs fully on your um, own pace and fully on your own, uh, taking the course to reach your entry level career uh, opportunities goal. So how do you do? How do you, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? How do you start? As I already mentioned, you have this QR code. That's your entry point to the first course. Also, you can navigate to skillsforall.com and either take a quick uh, just two minutes tour, video tour over the platform, or you can explore the course catalog and choose the course best suitable for you. You also can play with filters. You can select different languages, different uh, course categories, uh, and different level of the courses. And most importantly, it's absolutely and totally free. We don't charge anything. Let's switch to the next slide. And I want to very quickly point your attention to the login procedure, because uh, I think that's one important thing. As many of you are probably already at Cisco Networking Academy students, we have enabled the, out, uh, the authentication mechanism through Networking Academy login. So you can click Netacad login button and use your existing Networking Academy netacad.com credentials to login. Or if you don't have it, probably you have a Gmail account. You just can use your Google uh, account to access the platform. Or if not, just uh, create a new user on Skills for All that uh, should take you less than two minutes. Let's switch to the next slide, because on that next slide, I would like to uh, re-emphasize that it is mobile first and very much mobile friendly. And pretty much everything you do while you are going through the course is you are comfortably scrolling, reading, enjoying the course content, enjoying the, dig uh, the media, enjoying the quizzes and videos embedded into the course. Uh, if it comes to check your knowledge, you are doing that again inside of the course, continuing scrolling the page, either from your browser on the PC or from your mobile device. Are you in the airport or uh, in, in Metro? You can continue learning by uh, browsing, scrolling through the course and gaining your knowledge. Isn't it fun? Isn't it nice? I think it really is. Let's go to the next slide because I wanted to make sure that I don't forget about our instructor community. These are our most important people who are bringing a lot of knowledge to their students. And we have also implemented the instructor guided learning experience uh, in Skills for All. So if you are instructor, you can, uh, you will be, you should be able to switch your role to instructor and create your classes for your students, enroll your students and observe how they progress. Let's go to the next slide, because uh, we already uh, almost finished our, our uh, today's presentation. I just wanted to mention that it's not only in English, it's already translated. Uh, several courses are already translated in Spanish and Portuguese, and there are some more languages and translations coming. So stay tuned, it will come in your language, and please join us and improve your security and cybersecurity skills by taking a free learning journey at skillsforall.com. That's probably it from my side, and uh, back to you, Tyron. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing exciting opportunities available for us in cybersecurity. Who knows, many of you may choose a career based on the information that was shared today. So um, actually, we've received so many questions today and for Josh and, and for Samyan, but Josh uh, said that he'd be willing to answer as many questions as possible in a blog published in October for Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which is really cool and amazing. Thank you for that, Josh. I'm really excited. But in the interest of time, because we're kind of running over, uh, we're going to take two questions. And um, our first question actually comes from Danny. Uh, and is, is 
Is it necessary to be a software engineer to be an expert in cybersecurity? Thank you for that question, Danny. Uh, that actually goes back to my point around diverse backgrounds uh, actually can lead to very fulfilling and enriching careers in cybersecurity because there are so many areas that you can go into. So there are people who uh, are in our data privacy protection area. That's security adjacent, but more and more, I think it's being seen as part of the broader cybersecurity pantheon. A lot of those people come with a legal background. Uh, there are people who work in security when it comes to security operations centers, and they understand how to set up and install security because they're engineers that say maintain the platforms like the SIM tools, some of the playbooks that run and other things. They don't really know anything about software coding. They may, they may know some Python scripting, but they're really, you know, people who are focused on IT and maintaining IT. There are people who are involved in policy aspects, like figuring out we want the organization to behave in the correct way according to cybersecurity outcome. What, if, what is the guidance and the instruction we give that will lead to the right programs, the right processes, and the right infrastructure we build in order to secure ourselves? So you do not, the quick answer is your question, you do not. However, I have found that I did not go, you know, I did not have a computer engineering degree. My graduate degree, sub, uh, subsequently, I did go, go and focus on IT. It was more than, um, you know, it was before cybersecurity was its own dedicated discipline. And I never really learned to code. You know, I've used code. I know how to do some scripting and, you know, stuff like that. But I am not an expert in coding. So I've had a rich and fulfilling career in cybersecurity without that background. That said, it's something I've always felt made it a little bit more difficult for some of the things that I've wanted to get into. So, for example, I've done some malware reverse engineering stuff with um, SANS Institute, some of the classes they have there. Yes, you can sort of get by, but if you really don't know how software works and how to write scripts and how to create your own modules, you're going to be at a disadvantage. So I would say the more technical the focus, the more it is about malware, the more it is about you know, going after attackers, the more you're going to need software development expertise. And by that, I say coding. But there are so many other areas in cybersecurity that you won't need coding. A passing familiarity is probably enough that you have to, you don't have to worry about that somehow restraining your career opportunities. That's what I would say. Thank you, Josh. And the next question, we've gotten so many questions about password managers. So is there a best password manager? Which ones can we trust or like, are they a potential single point of failure? Well, tell us more about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, the three that I showed up there are good and reliable. I happen to use one password. I'm a Mac user and it started as Mac software. And so it's always worked very well on a Mac. Um, but I would say, look at, you know, those three, at least that I listed there and maybe Google for some more, but LastPass, Dashlane, and one password are, are good password managers. And by the way, if you're on a Mac, um, more and more Apple has this built in as the security keychain, So it can actually act natively as your, your password manager. And again, you could Google for that. Um, so, sorry, what was the other part of the question? What is the best password manager? And then. And then uh, which ones can we trust? And uh, are they a single point of failure? Single point of failure, yeah. So uh, when it comes to a single point of failure, you know, uh, I don't think that there's a huge risk of that because of the way they're set up. Um, there is one password you have to not forget, which is the password for logging in to the password manager. But you can authenticate to it using biometrics. So you've got your iPhone and you want to launch your one password or it's plugged into your browser and you want it to autofill something. You know, it's going to scan your face or it's going to ask you for your fingerprint. But every so often, like maybe every two weeks, it's going to ask you for your actual one password that is really the key to everything. That's the one password you have to keep secret and you have to make sure it's a good one. That's the one you have to remember. But these um, applications also let you sync to the cloud. So if you lose your device, hopefully there's a copy in the cloud that when you, you know, back up or restore, sorry, to a new device, then it's going to download all of your passwords there. Um, as far as trustworthiness, you know, I think that's another aspect. Um, you know, look at these password management companies, but for the most part, they encrypt your information. Um, 
as they receive it and as they store it, so they don't have access to your password. So even if they were compromised as companies, you know, ostensibly you're you would not be compromised. Uh, but yes, it can be thought of as you know, I am putting a lot of eggs in one basket. But trust me, that is you're far more secure than the alternative of having one password for all the website sites out there, or a bunch of you know lousy passwords for a ton of websites out there. Whatever it is, that is currently the best balance between security and resilience that you should be making. Thank you so much. And we'll be answering all your questions during Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So follow us on social media. Keep up with us. We've got so much planned for you guys. And thank you so much for joining us today. A special thanks to our speakers. The survey for this event is now available. So please take a moment to complete it. But before we go, I'm excited to announce the winners of our grand prize. These individuals are noteworthy for the effort they demonstrated in completing one module of the Introduction to Cybersecurity course before the start of the event. Um, I just want to say you guys worked really hard and we're really happy for you guys and you will all be re reached out to to receive your, your the next steps for your prize. And thank you so much for um, coming in. And again, thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. So glad to have had you on with us. Running makes me feel happy. My favorite part about cross country is like the mental part. I'm Max. When I was 11 years old, I was diagnosed with aplastic anemia.